The desert is an inhospitable place. To many it is a vast expanse of sand and heat, but some are determined enough to call it home. But what happens when a dream of homeland is taken away? And what justice can be offered by law? The answers to these questions and more lie in the land forgotten by time. This is the story of Western Zahara. Western Sahara is a largely empty expanse of desert on the Atlantic coast of West Africa that covers roughly 250,000 square kilometres. The region is rich in three primary resources, oil, fish and phosphates, the last of which is a key ingredient in the manufacture of plant fertilisers. Given both its location and its abundance in resources, the territory itself has always maintained a strategic value for the countries surrounding it and those from abroad. It is this inherent value that served to motivate the political developments that gave rise to this case. Western Zahara has been a focal point for many peoples throughout the centuries. Beginning with the Phoenicians, trade developed between the territory and the civilizations of the Mediterranean. What marked the turning point in the region's history, however, was the advent of the Spanish. In 1884, Emilio Benelli of the Sociedad Española de Africanistas y Colonistas, the Spanish Society of Africanists and Colonists, arrived in Rio de Oro and signed treaties with the coastal peoples. This laid the foundation for the Spanish government's control of the region, as it would go on to claim a protectorate over the coastal zone of the territory. Further colonization efforts would be pursued in the years following the treaty signing, with Cape Juby, occupied by Spain in 1916, and Guerra in 1920. Samara and the rest of the interior would be occupied fully in 1934. The territory would remain in Spanish hands for decades, but all this would soon change. 1945 saw the end of the Second World War. History's most destructive conflict had left its mark, and in the ashes of its wake, the world sought progress. The international community saw unity and oversight as essential in preventing another destructive conflict. The United Nations, the world's premier international body, was founded on the 24th of October 1945. The Charter, its founding document, established a number of principles for the new world order. Crucial to our story is Article 1, Paragraph 2. To develop friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples, and to take other appropriate measures to strengthen universal peace. The key word in that sentence is self-determination, the legal right of people to decide their own destiny in the international order. Alone, it is a powerful term, but when paired with another, they formed the basis for many changes in the international landscape. That word is decolonization. Together, these principles combined to form an important declaration. On December 14, 1960, the General Assembly of the UN passed Resolution 1514, whose first two provisions are arguably the most important. These two provisions would serve to shape the independence movements of many countries and frustrated mapmakers for years to come. And indeed, it would not take long for the effects to travel from New York to Western Sahara. In 1966, the UN General Assembly passed Resolution 2229, which called on Spain to hold a referendum on self-determination in Western Sahara. Beyond New York, however, a different force was brewing in Western Sahara itself. On May 10, 1973, a group of Sarawi University students would establish the Constituent Congress of the Polisario Front. Their mission? The fight for independence. Ten days later, men from the Constituent Congress attacked a Spanish outpost, initiating the war for the liberation of Western Sahara. The Front would go on to capture large swathes of the desert and started to impose themselves on the Spanish government in the region. The efforts of the Polisario Front would serve to add pressure to a Spanish government already facing intense scrutiny from the international community. And by 1974, their efforts paid off. Though Spain had maintained that Western Sahara was a province and not a colonial territory, it eventually relented. On August 20th, 1974, Spain announced that a referendum would be held on self-determination. It was scheduled to take place in the first six months of 1975. A simple plan, and yet as with all things, it quickly ran into a problem. Morocco, under the leadership of King Hassan, 
was not willing to accept a referendum with independence as one of the options. Independence had been supported by Spain, and though the shadow of Resolution 1514 loomed large, both Morocco and Mauritania used its provisions to argue their case. Both countries read an additional quality to Resolution 1514. New territories need not become independent. Instead, they could be incorporated into existing states once decolonized. The opposition of Morocco to the option of independence created an impasse that could not be easily resolved. Diplomacy was not the answer. For this, only the law would do. The International Court of Justice is the UN's judicial body, entrusted with adjudicating disputes of international law between countries. No one could ask for a better forum to settle this issue. In response to the impasse, the General Assembly passed Resolution 3292 on December 13, 1974. The ICJ was asked for an opinion on the situation. It is important to note that an advisory opinion is not binding on any of the parties to the case, and is requested specifically by the General Assembly in order to clarify points of law. And though unenforceable, this opinion would be important in setting the scene for the referendum and the options available. Two questions were put to the court. Was Western Sahara at the time of colonisation by Spain a territory belonging to no one, terra nullius? And if in the negative, what were the legal ties between this territory and the Kingdom of Morocco and the Mauritanian entity? The questions were focused on clarifying a key aspect of the dispute at hand, whether the territory of Western Sahara was tied with either Morocco or Mauritania. That Western Sahara and its people were to be free of Spanish control was never in doubt. The question was whether they could exist independently, or whether it was appropriate for the territory to become part of either of its geographical neighbours. Opportunity was given to Spain, Morocco and Mauritania to provide submissions with respect to their positions. On October 16, 1975, the court published its verdict. The court began by giving its opinion on the first question, whether Western Sahara belonged to no one at the time of its colonisation. To provide an answer, it would need to be established that at the time when Spain colonised the territory, the land itself belonged to no one and was therefore open to acquisition. The court proceeded to note that the practice among states at the time of Western Sahara's colonisation, that is in 1884, was to consider territories inhabited by tribes or peoples having a social and political organisation as owned territory. In situations where land was already inhabited, states had adopted the practice of acquiring sovereignty through agreements with local rulers, a point which the court noted as being different to occupation of land that was terra nullius. To this point, the court noted that Spain had, in its royal order of the 26th of December 1884, proclaimed that the king was taking the region under his protection on the basis of agreements which had been entered into with the chiefs of the local tribes. Having assessed the conduct of Spain in relation to the establishment of its control of Western Sahara, the court concluded that the territory had not been terra nullius, both because of the existence of people in the region and through Spain's conduct which evidenced an understanding that the territory was owned and controlled by others. As a result of answering the first question in the negative, the court proceeded to consider question two. What were the legal ties between this territory and the Kingdom of Morocco and the Mauritanian entity? In addressing the second question, both Morocco and Mauritania levied historical arguments in order to substantiate their respective positions. We shall first consider Morocco's argument. Morocco's argument was primarily based on the idea of immemorial possession of the territory. This consisted of public displays of sovereignty that had gone uninterrupted for centuries. To support this argument, Morocco made reference to historical events stretching as far back as the Arab conquests of North Africa in the 7th century. Elaborating on this point, Morocco noted that it was the only independent state which existed in Northwest Africa, and that there was geographical contiguity between it and the territory of Western Sahara. Morocco argued that part of its territory was home to many tribes. To substantiate this historical line of argument, Morocco submitted evidence that demonstrated the allegiance of Saharan leaders to the Sultan. 
This evidence consisted of decrees from the Sultan, tax documents and papers concerning the appointments of local leaders. The Sultan was claimed to exercise authority and influence on the nomad tribes in Western Zahara. Morocco also made reference to international acts which demonstrated the Sultan's authority over the region. Specifically, Morocco referred to a series of treaties signed with Spain, Britain and the United States which concerned the treatment of shipwrecked sailors. Additionally, Morocco provided diplomatic correspondence with a number of nations that indicated the international community's recognition of Morocco's authority. Great Britain was said to have recognised Morocco's ownership of the region in a treaty signed in 1895, while a Franco-German exchange of letters in 1911 expressed the understanding that Morocco comprises all that part of North Africa which is situated between Algeria, French West Africa and the Spanish colony of Rio de Oro. Mauritania's argument contained a number of overlaps with that of Morocco's, with one substantive difference. At the relevant period, the country did not exist. During the proceedings, Mauritania accepted that the Mauritanian entity that existed at the time did not constitute a state, and that its statehood was not retroactive. Mauritania argued not for legal ties of state sovereignty, but for other forms of legal ties which it alleged were present during the period. The Mauritanian entity was called the Bilad Shingwiti, and that was argued to have been characterised by a common language, way of life and religion. The most significant feature of the Bilad Shingwiti was the importance given to the Marabout tribes, who created a strong cultural tradition in religious studies, education, literature and poetry. Indeed, its fame in the Arab world derived from the reputation acquired by its scholars. Life in the arid areas of the Shingwiti country required the continuous quest for suitable pastures and waterholes, and each tribe had a well-defined migration area with established routes determined by the location of waterholes, burial grounds, cultivated areas and pastures. Tribes by necessity continued to make their traditional migrations, traversing the Shingwiti country comprised within the territory of the present-day Islamic Republic of Mauritania and Western Zahara. The same families and their properties were to be found on either side of the artificial frontier. Some wells, lands and burial grounds of the Rio de Oro, for example, belonged to Mauritanian tribes, while watering places and palm oases in what is now part of Mauritania were the properties of tribes of Western Zahara. These facts of life in the region, as Mauritania pointed out, were recognised by both France and Spain, which in 1934 concluded an administrative agreement to prevent any obstacles to the nomadic existence of these tribes. The legal relation between the part under Spanish administration and the Mauritanian entity was therefore simply one of inclusion. At that time, the Bilad Shingwiti was an entity united by historical, religious, cultural and legal ties, and it formed a community having its own cohesion. The territories occupied by Spain, on the other hand, did not form an entity of their own and did not have an, any identity. Western Zahara was, legally speaking, part of the Mauritanian entity. That part and the present territory of Mauritania together constituted the indissociable parts of the Bilad Shingwiti. In the light of the foregoing, Mauritania asked the court to find that at the time of the colonisation by Spain, the part of Zahara now under Spanish administration did have legal ties with the Mauritanian entity. At the same time, it took the position that where the Mauritanian entity ended, the Kingdom of Morocco began. In relation to Morocco, the court was blunt in its conclusions. It opened its decision by stating that the material produced in this case related to areas situated within Morocco itself and did not provide evidence of an effective display of authority in Western Sahara. Resultingly, the court was not convinced that Morocco had exercised territorial sovereignty over the region such that it could substantiate a claim over the territory. As for Morocco's international arguments, the court concluded that the international documentary evidence provided was insufficient to substantiate Morocco's authority over Western Sahara. With regard to the treaties on shipwrecked sailors, the court noted that the provisions of the agreements relied on the Sultan's influence with certain tribes, or his personal authority, to assist shipwrecked sailors. The decision noted, however, that this was different from implying international recognition of the Sultan as territorial sovereign of Western Zahara. 
The court went on to address the Anglo-Moroccan Agreement of 1895. The issue with this agreement was that the diplomatic correspondence relating to it indicated that Britain had repeatedly taken the position that the territory concerned in the agreement was outside Morocco's. Finally, as to the letters between France and Germany, the court noted that the agreements and diplomatic correspondence containing statements of recognition from other states were of limited value, as their purpose as documents was not to recognise existing sovereignty or deny its existence. Their purpose was to recognise the existence of a sphere of influence, as that term was used at the time. Effectively, such declarations amounted to nothing more than promises of non-interference and guarantees of freedom of action. In relation to Mauritania's argument, the court first noted that the information before it disclosed that at the time of the Spanish colonisation, there existed many ties between various tribes whose peoples dwelt in both Western Sahara and the Mauritanian entity. The conclusion, however, was drawn that the evidence put forth disclosed the independence of many of the tribes in relation to one another, and, despite some forms of common activity, the absence among them of any common institutions or organs, even of a quite minimal character, was detrimental to Mauritania's argument. The issue for the court was that the Mauritanian entity as described was difficult to define with characteristics that made it distinct. The proposition, therefore, that the Bilad Shingwiti should be considered as having been a Mauritanian entity, enjoying some form of sovereignty as in Western Zahara, was not one that could be sustained. As a result, the court concluded that at the time of colonisation by Spain, there did not exist between the territory of Western Zahara and Mauritania any tie of sovereignty or of allegiance of tribes, or of simple inclusion in the same legal entity. The court concluded that the materials and information presented showed the existence, at the time of Spanish colonisation, of ties between the Sultan of Morocco and some of the tribes living in the territory of Western Zahara. They equally showed the existence of rights, including some rights relating to land, between the Mauritanian entity and the territory of Western Zahara. On the other hand, the court's conclusion was that the material and information presented to it did not establish any tie of territorial sovereignty between the territory of Western Zahara and Morocco and Mauritania. Thus, the court did not find legal ties of such a nature as might affect the application of Resolution 1514 in the decolonization of Western Zahara, and in particular of the principle of self-determination. Though its conclusion was short, the court's decision was nonetheless key in setting the legal scene for the political developments that would take place in the years to come. These developments, however, would not play out as the court or the people of Western Zahara expected. The court's ruling was definitive, its answer not open to interpretation. Justice had been served, and the people of Western Zahara were vindicated. But the parties to the case had other plans. Following the advisory opinion, Morocco mobilised massively. In November 1975, 300,000 Moroccans, supported by troops, crossed the border into Western Zahara. This Green March, as it came to be known, set off a series of events that would come to define the fate of Western Zahara. On the 14th of November, Spain signed the Madrid Accords. Morocco gained the northern two-thirds of the area and control of the phosphates, while Mauritania gained the southern third. Three months later, Spain withdrew from Western Zahara. The next day, the Polisario Front declared a government in exile, called the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic, and started a campaign of guerrilla warfare against Morocco and Mauritania. In 1979, Mauritania withdrew from the conflict. The fighting against the Polisario Front had taken its toll in the country's resolve. It would sign a peace agreement with the Front. The withdrawal, however, allowed Morocco to annex the final third of the region. Though the 70s had been a troubling time for the region, the 1980s proved to be more fortunate. In 1982, the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic was admitted to the Organisation of African Unity, with Morocco resigning in protest. In 1988, the UN proposed a peace agreement that provided for a referendum for the indigenous Sahrawis to decide whether they wanted an independent Western Sahara under Polisario Front leadership, or whether the territory would officially become part of Morocco. This peace proposal was accepted by both Morocco and the Front, 
with both sides agreeing to a ceasefire in 1991. Before the referendum took place, however, Morocco moved tens of thousands of settlers into the territory and insisted that they have their voting qualifications assessed. This assessment of voting qualifications involved questions regarding the definition of who among the traditionally nomadic Sahrawis would be entitled to cast a ballot. This process would continue throughout the 90s and into the early 2000s. Meanwhile, Morocco continued to expand its physical infrastructure in the region despite widespread protest against its presence. The Polisario Front would continue its campaign, though not without setbacks. Many defected from the organisation, and there was reduction in support from Algeria, as that country was forced to concentrate on its own internal problems. Algeria's diplomatic campaign on behalf of Sahrawi self-determination, however, continued. By 2001, tens of thousands of Sahrawis, including numerous Polisario Front soldiers, had relocated to semi-permanent refugee camps in Algeria. The second millennium would continue similarly to the first. In 2001, following the death of Moroccan King Hassan II, Mohammed VI assumed the throne, announcing that Morocco no longer agreed to hold a referendum in Western Sahara. In 2003, the UN proposed autonomy for the territory for five years, followed by a referendum, though this was rejected by Morocco. This was followed by a Moroccan proposal in 2007, which offered autonomy but no referendum. In 2018, the United States argued that the UN peacekeeping forces should only remain in the region if there was progress towards settling the issue. Morocco and the Polisario Front would meet in December of that year to renew discussion over the situation. The negotiations bore little fruit, however, and the UN renewed its peacekeeping mission nonetheless. In the second half of 2020, the Polisario Front began obstructing a key trade route between Morocco and Mauritania. Morocco launched a military operation in November to break the blockade, prompting the Front to announce that it would no longer observe the 1991 ceasefire agreement. Currently, there are around 600,000 people living in the region, with only 25% living in Polisario areas. Morocco continues to control 85% of Western Sahara. While the advisory opinion has explicitly dismissed Morocco's sovereignty over the region, it continues to control two-thirds of the territory. Most importantly, Morocco controls the vast majority of Western Sahara's natural resources. Today, the region is commonly referred to as Africa's last colony. To say that the outcome of such complex legal proceedings is disappointing would be an understatement. The people of Western Sahara had, and continue to have, a right to self-determination. The promised referendum? Non-existent. The justice they sought? Denied. Their struggle? Ongoing. In many ways, this legal story is one that mirrors the very people it concerns. People of strength and determination, willing to brave the odds to build a new home. The international community, like the desert, can be an inhospitable place. There is no certainty, and only the most determined can survive. But every so often, one finds an oasis, an opportunity and the chance at liberation, freedom and prosperity. For the Sahrawi people, that opportunity lay with the International Court of Justice. And in their struggle for liberation, they would succeed. If something can be said, it is that in that vast expanse of desert that is Western Sahara, there is always an oasis waiting, waiting for a weary traveller to rest and replenish, to plan and prepare for the next step of their journey. The fate of the Sahrawi people and of Western Sahara has not been decided. For like the nomads of the desert, the paths are many, and there is always an oasis waiting to be discovered. This case stands as a testament to the strength and determination of the Sahrawi people, who have not given up, and who know that the law is on their side. This is Tales from the Law. From wherever you may be watching, I wish you a lovely day ahead.